welcome to the inaugural episode of Kino Inferno. I am one of your hosts, Aiden, And I am your other host, I'm Mark, and we're here today to basically do what we always do. We're just going to talk about some films. Yes, but before we do that, we should set up the premise of this very well thought out podcast. <laughs> As, uh, yeah, I believe you. Believed every word of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is Kino Inferno. Uh, it's a little project that me and Aiden have been talking about doing for a while. Uh, we spend a lot of our time just discussing films anyway, so we thought we might as well actually, you know, try and get paid for it. Because uh, uh, yes. you know, if you're good at something, don't the, do it for the free. lucrative podcast market. <laughs> just let me have this one thing <laughs> uh, <laughs> um so yeah the premise of this show is like many other film podcasts um we're going to be discussing two films that have some kind of inbuilt uh connection uh, be it to do with the actual production of the movie it could be something on a story level it can kind of be anything yeah a, a loose tenuous connection between the two films yeah, something that we can relate. So the idea is that one of us will suggest a film that we want to talk about, and then the other one will think of another, think of a film which they can then pair with it uh, due to something that those films have in common. You know, we're not going to go say, like, "Oh, these both have the same actor in it," because that's fucking boring. No, it's got to be something. It's got to be something interesting at least. Yeah, more more like a thematic thing, or yeah, or perhaps maybe you know we we both choose a film that have a weirdly specific thing that happens in it, kind of like. A, the example I've always used, and you know, shout out to the guys at Red Letter Media because you know they're fantastic. Um, they talk about how uh, Mandy, the Nicolas Cage movie, and the Lu- Luca Guadagnino Suspiria, they're both films that feature scenes of a woman laughing at a man's flaccid penis. And they both also happen to be art house horror movies that came out in the same year, I believe. So it's, it's stuff like that. That's the kind yeah, of stuff I'd yeah. like to talk about. So look out for the uh, flaccid penis. <laughs> <laughs> laughter episode of Kino Inferno. I would happily talk about both of those films. I have a lot of thoughts on both. So, uh, let's so absolutely yeah, talk about that. It's a movie discussion podcast. We're going to discuss the two films uh, in whatever level of depth and seriousness we choose to take on that uh, given episode. I feel like that just depends on the sobriety of the two of us at the time. Yes. I don't know what you mean. I'm <laughs> sober as a judge at all times. Um, Please. <laughs> um <laughs> No, but yeah, then uh, our trademark uh, rating system will be deployed at the end, where we decide, is this film pure Kino? Pure, unfiltered Kino? Or is it going in the fire? That's the idea. Is it going in the inferno? We in no way reverse engineered that from already having the title. (laughs) Absolutely That was always the premise. (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. That title was built built purely out of that. Uh, we didn't just think that Kino Inferno sounded cool. Uh, no. But that is our rating system, so is it Kino or does it go in the fire? Which one is it? Uh, not that we condone burning anything. We, we can't do that. No, we do condone burning things, yes. Um, We're not even five minutes <laughs> in. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I think it's good to have a rating system that's entirely binary and has no room for nuance whatsoever. <laughs> because... <laughs> That is what modern film discussion is. Agreed. So uh, in terms of the kind of films that we're going to be talking about, um, we're both sort of fans of like the weird stuff, the cult stuff, um, yeah, mm. the interesting stuff. Like, you know, there's millions upon millions of films out there, but we tend to like the strange stuff. And I think that's really what we're going to be focusing on when we talk about this. So today's picks are not particularly weird, but they're definitely cult favourites. They're both cult faves, though. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, like, you know, as much as I hate using terms like, you know, a mainstream audience... I don't think either films are particularly geared towards a mainstream audience. Um, no. Particularly my pick. Um, I think that's a little bit more... I don't know, I don't know really. I mean, I guess we can talk about that. We can talk about that. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. certainly. So for this discussion, I've brought one of my favourite films, uh, which is Whiffnail and I, or Whiffnell and I. I mean, I've always wondered about what the actual correct pronunciation of that is, because I know in the movie, some people call him Whiffnail and some people call him Whiffnell. Uh, I've always said Whiffnail. Okay, so you're you're going against the grain. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Well, no, I, I've always I've always said with nail. Yeah, yeah, I've always yeah. was with nail as well. But I think in the movie, but you know, I'm guessing they have like London dialect and stuff, don't they? So it's with nail. Uh, but yeah, yes. so I've chosen with nail and I, and uh, my glorious assistant here has chosen this is Spinal Tap. I don't know about glorious assistant. I'm, uh, you know. Okay, I, sh- I should have said glamorous. <laughs> I feel. I think that's what I was going for. I mean, it's more the assistant part. Now, <laughs> I felt like you were. Glo- Glorious is fine, but, you know. Fair enough, all right. This is going to devolve into a situation where we're debating on 
whose name has to go above the title and whose name's on the right, whose name's on the left, by how many inches is higher. I was about to say we're going to end up doing that <laughs> where we both get top billing, but they're like kind of tiered. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do they still do that? The, is that still a thing? Yes. Yes, they absolutely do. Okay. And um, listeners will find out I'm completely obsessed with the ways people are credited in films. Yeah, because um, I'm just thinking, like, I, the, the, weirdly, the two examples of that I always think of is, <laughs> it's a very strange place, is Chicago, because I remember, I remember reading apparently there was a huge, like back and forth between i think it was renee zellweger and who's the other one uh, Catherine zeta jones Catherine zeta jones yes. that's it um yeah apparently there was a huge uh thing between their agents over how they were credited which is bollocks right because renee zellweger is the lead character yeah, she's the yeah she, she is the protagonist yeah. of chicago and um Catherine zeta jones's character is just she's the support yeah also was, so, was Catherine zeta jones more su- successful than renee zellweger at that point in time like I don't really know. I don't really know. But anyway, we're not talking about I Chicago. Mean, uh, no. But also, the other not. one I think of is uh, Halloween 2, which, as you know, is one of my favourite films. Um, yes. Yeah, That because apparently if, there was like a dispute because they didn't think that Jamie Lee Curtis should be credited above Donald Pleasance, even though, oh, okay. even though she kind of is the protagonist of that film. Uh, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But, yes. I mean, that's, that's an example where they should have gone down my favourite solution for this, which is... Donald Pleasance should have been and Donald Pleasance yeah. as as Doctor Loomis. Yeah, even though you're gonna have the and as. Even though I'm pretty certain, if you look back at that movie, I'm pretty sure Donald Pleasance has more screen time than Jamie Lee Curtis does because she's just in a fucking hospital bed for the majority of the film. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Anyway, we're we're doing what we usually do, and we're getting sidetracked. Yeah, we're not here to talk about uh, the Halloween yet. No, but I definitely do want to talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean, we couldn't get through this entire podcast without talking about Halloween at some point. That's true. You're, yeah, I mean, I don't, I can't get through most conversations without bringing up Michael Myers, to be honest. Anyway, so <laughs> moving on to it. So uh, yeah, with Nell and I, and this is Spinal Tap. Um, it's our first episode. Which one do you think we should go for? Let's flip a coin. Do you have a coin to hand? I mean, I'm doing a, a mime for the benefit I of the. I literally for, of just watched you. Do absolutely that. no. I just one. watched you do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was amazing. Okay, should we? Should we? I tell you, what, should we go alphabetically? Uh, yes. Why not? So, Spinal Tap is first then. Your first drummer was uh, the Peeps. John Stampy Peeps. Oh, yeah. Great, great, uh, tall, blonde, geek with glasses. Yeah. Uh, good drummer. Great look. Good drummer. Good, yeah. Good yeah, drummer. Yeah, what happened to him? He died. He he died in a bizarre gardening accident some years back. It's Very really one of those one. things. It was, you know, the authorities said, you know, best leave it. Yeah, it's not unsolved, yeah. really. You know. And he was replaced by uh... Stumpy Joe. Eric Stumpy Eric Joe. Child. Child. Yeah. And Eric. what happened to Stumpy Joe? Well, uh, it's not a very pleasant story, but no. uh, he's, uh, he, passed he died. Uh, he choked on uh, the, the the official explanation was he choked on vomit. It was and actually he uh, away. It was actually someone else's vomit. It's not. It's <laughs> ugly. You know, there's no real. Well, they can't yeah, prove still... whose vomit it was. They never, they don't have no, facilities don't in Scotland no Yard to, to you print can't really dust for vomit. This is Spinal Tap is a 1984 mockumentary following fictional heavy metal group Spinal Tap as they embark on an ill-fated US tour in promotion of their new album Smell the Glove. As Tap struggle to come to terms with their decline in popularity and relevance, tensions from within the band grow exacerbated by a growing power struggle between the band's manager and the front man's girlfriend. Hilarity ensues. Probably the best summation of this is Spinal Tap I've ever heard, because I feel like when most people talk about it, the plot is not the thing that they talk about. No, well, the plot is fairly loose. I feel like this is Spinal Tap, and we'll get to this as well when we discuss uh, Withnell and I, and it kind of feels more like a series of almost sketches and vignettes than mm. and like an actual full story even though it does have a story uh, it's a very well story. i think that's a product of the majority of the film being improvised yeah completely and um obviously it being a mockumentary most of the film is taken up with uh the sort of quote-unquote interviews mm-hmm. uh between uh well it's primarily between uh three members of the band so this is the two guitarists uh slash front men uh david st hubbins and nigel tufnell and of course, the bassist played by Harry Shearer of The Simpsons fame, uh, Mr. Derek, Mr. Derek Smalls. It's 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 honestly weird seeing Harry Shearer in live action things. I'm not entirely sure why, but I always find it odd. 
probably his own. Yeah. yeah, I was just kind of picture him as Mr. Burns, I think. Yeah, so we should probably, um, before we kind of, I mean, I'm assuming most people have seen This is Spinal Tap who are listening to this. I'd hope so, I mean, because you should, because it's, you know, it's fantastic, yeah. it really is. Um, I should probably kind of um, state that this film is a really interesting uh, kind of snapshot of uh, a lot of different things. Obviously, it's, it's a very accurate parody of the heavy metal world of that time. Oh, completely. Uh, there's a lot of different um, bands that they drew from. Uh, I, I think I remember seeing them mention that they were slightly based, that Spinal Tap itself was slightly based on the band Saxon yep. and slightly based on um, the Ozzy Osbourne departed black sabbath yep uh, so black oh, oh sorry the black sabbath after ronnie james dio as well i think was yeah because uh, yeah when they went through like a cycle of uh, new singers and stuff yeah and it was kind of that decline in relevance really because it's also i know for a fact there's several uh like rock and metal bands uh, steve tyler in particular talks a lot about how he finds spinal tap nearly unwatchable purely due to how realistic it is like he finds it uncomfortable yeah. to watch the film because it's just so true to like his own experience of being in that lifestyle. Well, that's an interesting point because um, when the movie first came out, I think people were genuinely it kind of had the Blair Witch thing where people were a bit like, "Is this actually real?" Because it does, as much as it's a comedy, and obviously a lot of the comedy is derived from how uh, inept they are as a band in general. Yeah. You know, f- famous. I mean, any- anyone who's a-, a musician of any kind has heard people refer to having a spinal tap moment on stage. Absol- right, absolutely, like, yeah. Just everything goes wrong. There's technical issues. You know, that kind of thing. Like the famous scene is obviously where they're coming out of these weird uh, props they've got on the stage. These yeah. kind of chrysalis-like pods. Yeah. And um, Derek gets stuck in one part. The other two open just fine, and they're just playing, <laughs> playing away. And Derek's just trying to get out of this part. And then at one point, the stagehand comes on with a blowtorch. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. My favorite thing about that moment is just uh, how at the end, they, at the end of the song, there the other two go back into the pod, <laughs> and the pods close. It's only at that point the the bassist he so, gets yeah, out. He gets yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I love that. Yeah, but yes, what I was saying is uh, um, I think they ride that line of absurdity to realism quite well because there's nothing... like If you didn't know the context of this is a mockumentary, this isn't a real band, you could quite easily watch this and kind of be somewhat fooled. Obviously, you, obviously you'd, you'd, you'd probably get the gist by the end of the movie that it's a, a comedy, but there's, there's enough stuff in there that isn't beyond the realm of possibility. They're quite... Um, clever with the way they do it yeah i agree i don't think it ever completely goes down into being like an outright farce or like you know like a really obvious joke and i think the the improvisation really helps with that because none of the uh, obviously the cat we should talk about the cast a little bit we've mentioned harry shearer but obviously you've also got uh, michael mckean as david st hubbins and christopher guest as nigel tuffy and obviously christopher guest is most notably known for being a director more than anything um, yeah, and a director of mockumentaries for yeah, the most part. With and you know he's most famous for working with uh, predominantly like Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, who are known yes. for you know creating and improvising characters. So this is that was kind of what I really liked about going back and rewatching it because I, I literally watched it this afternoon. It was the first time I'd seen it. I mentioned to you earlier, it's the first time I'd seen it in probably a decade. I've seen it many, many times. I mean, I watched it again last night for this, but I, I, it was one of those films that I didn't really need to take notes because I've seen it that many times. Yeah, that was like me with Withnail and I. So um, I was just, I was just happy I got to spend another ninety minutes watching that. To be honest, um, but no, I, uh, I felt like this is Spinal Tap really kind of feels like the beginning of that. It feels like that's kind of where Christopher Guest got the the main inspiration to do those kinds of films. Mm. And yeah, and I feel like you could completely compare this as Spinal Tap to something like Best in Show or Waiting for Guffman and all of that kind yes. of stuff. I'd probably yeah. say it's, for me personally, I think it might actually be a lot funnier than those movies. I think it has more of a combination of styles of humour, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there's like absurdist stuff, and then there's like really good wordplay, and then there's just... Uh, and also, I feel like as well, because both me and you are big fans of like you know, rock music in general, and particularly yes. we, we bond over a lot of classic rock, which is always uh, something mm. I've loved. And having watched documentaries about classic rock bands and classic metal bands... I feel like if somebody you you actually could fool somebody into thinking it was real because especially the yeah. the opening is identical to most of these documentaries about rock bands. Yes, and they're very um, they're very well observed characters. I would say absolutely. Particularly, I noticed at the beginning when the band are sat around being interviewed when they're in England and they've got like a giant <laughs> lordly castle behind them. That I yeah, guess they're supposed yeah. to live in. 
Um, and yeah, I thought that was just a great, like, immediately, I don't think that's a visual gag that will register to a lot of people, but mm. I thought that was honestly the first thing in the film that really made me like laugh out loud. Well, that is the thing that always strikes me whenever I watch This is Spinal Tap, and I've seen it, it must be in the double figures now, the amount yeah, of times yeah, I've yeah. seen it, because I think I first watched it when I was like 13, 14, maybe. Yeah, I think I was around that age when I first saw it. Yeah, and it was because, it was one of those things where... I don't really know how I'd picked up on it. I, I guess I'd wanted to watch it because it was, um, you know, I was into heavy metal and all that kind of thing. And um, I think I got the DVD for a birthday or Christmas. And it just, it blew my mind then. And it continues to blow my mind every time I watch it because it is so layered with humour. Yeah. The, and that, I think that's what sets it apart from the other Christopher Guest movies, which I, I like a lot. Yeah, same. Yeah. But I think there's this, this complete layering of humour in every scene. There's multiple gags that work on multiple different levels. And I think it's one of those things where it is lightning in a bottle, where you got the right cast with the right mentality at the right time. And I noticed actually this time as I was taking notes, the writer's credits go to uh, Christopher Guest, Michael McKean, uh, Harry Shearer, and Rob Rayner, the director, who also plays the director of the documentary in the film. So clearly it was one of those things where the four of them, being the main creative force, just really gel in this way where they bring out the best in each other. Absolutely, yeah. And... You're right, that, that, that scene you're describing where they're being interviewed in England and there's the palatial manager behind them, that is one of the, and that's early on in the film, but that's one of the best and funniest scenes because it's all four of them are bouncing off each other and providing just so many different layers of humour. And I'd, 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 I'd watch, having watched it a few times, I did notice, I do think there's a bit where uh, Christopher Guest, famously uh, hard to make laugh, uh, he, he's one of these people, he doesn't understand why he's funny, right? Like, yeah. that's one of the things about him. But um, there's the, I think he corpses in that scene. Do you know when uh, Rob Rayner comes out with the... Because um, there's a, a scene where they're going through all the albums and he's, described, he's reading the bad reviews of the albums. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's, some, there's the famous bit where he brings out the, uh, the Shark Sandwich album, which is great on its own, <laughs> having an album called Shark Sandwich. But then he goes, oh, it's, only, it's, a, a word, it's a review that consists of only two words shit sandwich <laughs> and it cuts to uh I nigel mean, yeah. played by christopher and he is definitely corpse in that moment yeah so no one published that <laughs> yeah you can't print that <laughs> yeah, like again, um, i feel like that's such a genuine reaction <laughs> the yeah like that like you feel like that's a reaction of the actors being surprised by the line but also like yeah. them knowing that their characters would be outraged <laughs> by yeah. being told that um, yes, yeah, it's, it's the indignant laughter. Yeah. One of the things that really stands out to me about the movie that I've not heard many other people talk about is how, for an American film with an entirely American cast, how convincingly and authentically British those yes. characters and the, a lot of the humour in the film is. Their British accents are like spot on. Spot on. Yeah, because like... it's not just the accents. I think it's the terminology. It is the terminology that sells it. There's a bit where I, I think uh, David Saint Hubbins is describing um, how he, his girlfriend will give advice to the band and then he'll go and tart it up for the other band members. And it's, it's just little things like that that Americans don't say, but the British people do say. And that just kind of sells the authenticity of it. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree because, yeah, they, they use a lot of like proper English slang which makes the characters feel really natural. And I think there's a real sense of sincerity to This Is Spinal Tap. I feel like it's made, yeah. With, yeah, it's made with affection for that kind of music and that kind of lifestyle. I don't think any of the characters in the band are inherently bad people. No, they're just fools, really. Yeah, they're just yeah. kind of, like, it's like the only thing in life that they know how to do is play music. Well, because they mentioned that David and Nigel have been in various different bands since they were very, very young. And that's kind of the core of the movie to me is the, the relationship between the two of them and the, the hurdles that kind of get in the way of that. Because as much as um, Harry Shearer's character, Derek, is, is there, he, well, he even sums up his role in the band as being, um, what does he says? Uh, he says that uh, David's fire and Nigel's ice and he's like lukewarm water in the middle. He's just kind of placid, you know. Yeah, which, you know, as uh, many, many bass players in bands would probably agree. Because that you know, I know a lot of bass players, and that's exactly how they feel in bands. They feel like they're the kind of the the cement between the bricks, as it were. And that's very yeah. much what he is. Because the film is about those two and their relationship, yeah. and that does kind of bring us into the the, the connection between these two films we want to talk about, um, which was on yes. your suggestion here. The idea about uh, Arrested Development, not the sitcom. No, no, not the um, sitcom. Not the sitcom. <laughs> the state of being. The state of yeah, being. I think. Um, 
yeah, we will find a snappy way to phrase this, but I think that both the movies we're kind of discussing are essentially about uh, variants of like boy men, really. Mm-hmm. Um, Spinal Tap, I think, has a slightly uh, softer heart towards its protagonists. Absolutely. And and in fairness, the 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 Spinal Tap boy, we'll get into with Nell in a minute, but the Spinal Tap boys are not as toxic as the relationship depicted in with now but they do have that thing where their slightly stunted emotional growth kind of means that they're in this bizarre insular little universe and like when they introduce all the characters at the start so you have all the, the members of the band the three main guys then you have the keyboardist who's a great side character because he's just off off his tits constantly <laughs> and uh well the the current drummer, one in the long line of drummers who've all Probably met my favourite joke Grizzly in ends. Spinal yes. Tap is the whole life expectancy of a Spinal Tap drummer. I think that's just a great <laughs> joke. And I love that it's there from the very beginning of the movie as well. Yes, yes. Uh, fact, um, yeah, they just keep adding interesting, to the, it. The, the guy who plays the drummer uh, is a bloke called RJ Parnell, and he's a real rock and roll drummer. He was the drummer for the uh, kind of 70s psychedelic band Atomic Rooster. Oh, really? I'd never do that. Yes, so he is, um, and I think he's wonderful in the movie as well, considering he's not an actor. He only gets a few lines here and there, but his deliveries are always very funny. And I love the detail of um, uh, Rob Reiner as Marty is interviewing him in the bath. <laughs> That's just not explained. <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel like that might be a direct, I, in some way I feel like it's a reference. I need to check whether or not it came before or after Spinal Tap, but um, I think you're going to know exactly what I mean when I say uh, it's like that clip from the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization. Yes, yes. With Chris Holmes, the guitarist of Wasp. Um, yes, Also, yes. Shout, shout out to Wasp. What a band. What a um, band. What a band indeed. Um, <laughs> but yeah, where Chris Holmes is sat in an inflatable... Is it an inflatable chair? Or like just like a pool chair in the water, drinking like a litre bottle of vodka, whilst his <laughs> mum is just sat on the side of the pool looking at him. <laughs> and I'm wondering if it's supposed to be like a sort of reference to that. Yeah, I do, yeah. The, I'd the like drum to hope so. I hope so. But yeah, the drummer does get a couple of great lines here and there. Um, like, I love the bit where Marty's asking him about, um, did the guy sort of tell you about the, the curse of the Spinal Tap drummers? <laughs> That's very funny. Um, but I also like, he gets a line over the end credits where he's talking about, um, uh, you know, his, his life motto is sex and drugs and rock and roll. And he goes, oh, what, what, what would you do if you weren't a rock star? And he goes, well, so long as there's sex and drugs, I could do without the rock and roll. <laughs> So yeah, for anybody who may have not actually seen uh, Spinal Tap, um, yeah, the running joke in the movie is that their drummers just keep dying. Yes, in mysterious circumstances. Yeah, like one of them just spontaneously combusted. Yes. Uh, And I think that's why I love that gag so much, is because I feel like that's the kind of gag that you could really go overboard on. Mm. And you could have it descend into like, you know, gore and violence, and they never do that. They they play that they play that gag so straight, and the fact that the band are so unfazed by their drummers yeah. dying at this stage <laughs> again is I feel like that again that's kind of part of their arrested development as it were because they because mm. they they were a successful band that's the point of it yes is that they had a degree of success and they're now I, mean, I think it's kind of all. it's kind of shown in the sequence where they're talking about um, the various bands they were before they were Spinal Tap yeah. and also the various phases of Spinal Tap so you saw you see a sort of like typical Beatles knockoff early yeah. on and then they kind of become a psychedelic band and then a heavy metal band which is true to a lot of the heavy metal bands of the 70s and 80s they all started off as yeah I'd always uh, the example that I thought of even though you know he's he's done a bit of metal but um, it's Alice Cooper because the original Alice Cooper band yes. were a weird hippie freakout band and their first yeah. two albums are frankly fucking awful I get the sense that as Spinal Tap they were always um kind of trend chasers really without yeah. much of a an identity to them i think that's kind of so on, on the level that they were they were clearly a bit successful because there is a bit later on where they're playing an old song of theirs on the radio and um they're all enjoying that until the radio announcer says uh, that was spinal tap uh, now confined to the where are they now folder. yeah and i feel like that's where the whole like arrested development thing comes in because clearly mm-hmm. they had a degree of success at a young age Mm. and they've just like you know they've played gigs and made music and that's literally just that's completely where they're at emotionally and yeah uh because like you know what only one of them actually has a girlfriend which is yes david yeah and i think he's um that's an interesting part of the film actually especially watching it now um as a slightly older person myself than when i was when i first saw it is that you see that david certainly wants to be the adult of the group yeah Um, he he is he's just as he's just as adult and as 
confused as the rest of them. Yeah, because um, uh, probably my one moment that stands out to me is when his girlfriend, who I this, I watched the film the other day, I can't remember any of the... Uh, Janine is Janine, the Janine, that's it. Yeah, where yeah. Janine shows up, and obviously the other band members aren't particularly happy about that, but it's where they're on the tour bus, and the rest of the band are in the back with groupies, and clearly, you know, like, doing drugs and all sorts. And he just... And uh, play, playing 1980s video games, yes, don't forget. Yes, they are, because, yeah, he makes a big point about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, he's there with Janine, and he, he's constantly just looking to towards the back because that's where he wants to be mm. and he's not interested in spending time with her despite her actually you know making this effort to come and see him and i think it's kind of telling as well the relationship with janine because obviously as i mentioned in the synopsis uh, there is a kind of subplot of the power play between the the band's manager ian who is a uh, quite a piece of work we'll get into that oh yeah anyway. yeah i feel like yeah the band themselves i don't think are terrible people ian however no. <laughs> yes ian and janine are kind of str- struggling for control over the band in various ways yeah and ian kind of goes more of a a tyrannical i guess way Uh, i love that again like for me going back to the whole like thoroughly britishness of the movie the fact that he keeps a cricket bat on his coffee table is the most british thing in that fucking film (laughs) yeah so that is one of my favorite exchanges where marty asks about the cricket bat and he says about him as a bit of an affectation it's totemistic but in the topsy turvy world of rock and roll, it always helps to have a big piece of wood in your hand, and then it, and then it comes to him just trashing a TV, trashing the table. And again, that, again, that's what the humor of the movie is like. This, it's so multi layered. There's so much, like, just that one line of dialogue that you just repeated has so much to it. And I, again, like, it's the kind of thing where I watched it today, and I, would, I actually would want to watch it again relatively soon because I feel like there's so much more to that film that I need to sort of pick apart. But that's something I did want to ask about with them. Um... So my, so my kind of um, perspective on the movie now um, is that kind of, since we're talking about it from the, through the lens of these kind of boy men kind of living in their weird insular little universe where they're the kind of kings of their own domain to some degree, or at least in their mind they are. I think what's really interesting is the, the two figures who kind of represent, um, if you like, adulthood or, or encroaching responsibilities. You have Janine, David's girlfriend, who is clearly the boy's idea of what an adult is like but then when you consider what she is like she's one of these weird hippies who who doesn't have any real philosophy but acts like she's some kind of mystic is always rambling on about the zodiac is always kind of wants to dress the band up as zodiac animals and... yeah because that scene at the end isn't there where the, um, she's handing out their star charts and, <laughs> yes, and, and yes. clearly clearly none of them fucking care <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, one, that is great um but then also you have on the other end of that you have ian who is very much the um the dad figure in this movie to some degree and that he's very carrot and stick with them he kind of he tries to he, you know he, he sweet talks them when he has to but then he's always got the ever-present cricket bat in case he needs to uh <laughs> okay, stole out of some vengeance yeah. <laughs> and he's very quick to anger with people who are kind of like there's the scene where he's uh having a pop at the hotel uh, clerks who have messed up the room order and all that kind of thing. Um, which, by the way, has one of my favourite line deliveries of just one of the random characters they meet, where he, go, where he calls the uh, the hotel clerk an old fruit, and the guy yeah. just goes, I'm just as God made me, sir. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, kind of, I quite liked that exchange as well, because I mm. like the fact that, you know, Ian kind of delves into insulting the guy on that level, yeah. and that guy just takes it as, oh, well, I am what I am, fuck you. And I, for, <laughs> for a film in that time, Time, I thought that was actually that's surprisingly positive in a weird way. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of it's, it's an interesting thing though because Ian clearly has this. I think all of the characters to some degree have this image of themselves that is not quite gelling with reality. Where Ian wants to be this this power player, this mover and the shaker, but ultimately he's hitched his wagon to a band that are going absolutely nowhere. Yeah, completely. The, the entire mm. band has this illusion of grandeur. Well, he even says at the start, Ian even says at the start when Marty asks him about, um, you know, the band's dwindling popularity, he says, oh, well, I don't see it that way. I see it as their, uh, it says something to the effect of I see it as their appeal is becoming more selective. Yeah, which is his way of saying, oh, you know, like the people that still like them still like them. Um, yeah. And, you know, the rest were like poses, I guess. You could sort of see it as that idea. But, you know, you can kind of see this idea that the band have, like, th- you know, they're pretentious, essentially. They 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 have this idea of grandeur about themselves that's just not true. And you kind of well, see one that. Well, one of the most perfectly executed jokes about pretension ever written is when you see uh, Nigel with his piano piece that he's composed. It's ah, influenced yes. by, he says he's influenced by uh, Mozart Bach and, and Mozart. Bach. Yeah. And he plays this lilting kind of piano tune then just perfect delivery where marty goes 
uh, what's the title of that piece? And he goes, uh, it's Lick My Love Pump. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> that. It's when he says uh, it's inspired by uh, Bach and uh, Mozart. And he says it's, it's kind of in between. It's like a mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, I love that. It's a great I mean, the problem character. with reviewing this as Spinal Tap or, or discussing this as Spinal Tap is we're going to descend into quotes pretty quickly. Yeah, but... and I feel like when we move into the next film, it's probably going to be along the pretty same Pretty much lines, the same, yeah. yeah. But that's probably why these films have endured so long. Yeah, I, and I think Spinal Tap is one of those things. Um, I don't think I've ever met anyone who said I don't like Spinal Tap, but I think there is a, a select audience to whom it really, really appeals and speaks to on a number of different levels. What I was going to say about it is I think, and this is typical of Christopher Guest's work uh, after this as well, is it explores these characters. As you say, they have these pretensions about themselves. And I think what the mockumentary format allows the film to do is to really expose the ways in which they're failing to live up to this version of themselves that they're trying to project to the audience. Exactly, yeah, because you have the characters performing to, directly to the camera, Yes. but then the camera keeps rolling and sees the reality underneath. And I think Spinal Tap does that perfectly, and Christopher Guest, as you say, has done that even better mm. in some areas. And again, I particularly like not only mention them because I adore the two of them, but I feel like that's why he works so well with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, is because yes, they yeah. completely know how to... like break down the, the barriers between their characters yeah it's that multi-layered performing that the that the mockumentary format kind of forces them to do where like as you say you're not just thinking about who the character actually is you're thinking about who they're trying to project themselves as exactly i think a lot of mockumentaries actually really fail in that regard because they i feel like a lot of mockumentaries try and focus on the 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 filming aspect of it they try and make it yes. so like oh like you'll see a boom mic slip in and stuff and they, they try and think that's the way that the humor should go and it's not and again like there isn't any of that in this film from what i remember no, no well we assume that marty de Berge is a uh, somewhat competent filmmaker yeah although uh, i believe the only credits he lists at the start are a dog food commercial um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. I I also love in Marty's opening spiel at the start. Though, he describes them as Britain's loudest band. That's a, <laughs> that's a line that always gets me. Well, again, and again, like... that's a perfect thing because considering most of this film was improvised, the thing that always strikes me on a rewatch is how well things are set up for later scenes. Because yep. that bit at the start where he says about you know the honorific of the world's uh, of Britain's loudest band, that is set up for the iconic Put it to the 11. amps go up to eleven gag. Yeah. Exactly. Right, because the, and like, there's so much of that, and like, obviously, there's the. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't exactly know how much breaks down to what was scripted and what was, um, what wasn't, but from what I can tell, even the gag about the the drummers all dying off, at least the specific ways in which they died off, seem to be improvised in the moment. Yeah, because obviously, the goes up to eleven thing is clearly scripted because yes. they would have had to have built amps. <laughs> that have the that number 11, to 11 yes. uh, but... one thing one thing we should talk about actually before we do before we move on is the music in this is spinal tap is so good yes it's played to absolute perfection like and it is really them it is really them playing it as yeah, well i was thinking that when i was watching it because i do like as you know i play guitar and bass not very well yeah. but i do and it one of the things that bothers me in films is when you see uh, characters playing instruments and they're clearly not playing them yeah, but they can all play. I mean, this is the thing. Spinal Tap uh, have they've played toured. live gigs. Yeah, 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 they've toured. Yeah, they've released albums and stuff. They played. Uh, they played Monsters of Rock and stuff like that. Like they, <laughs> they were an actual like touring act. And of course, most famously, they played Springfield. Of course, yes. Because <laughs> again, because clearly we can't ever have a conversation about the Simpsons coming into it. So no, but that is a that is one of the most perfect Simpsons cameos of all time. I often will just be sitting and to myself and just randomly hear the line. What is this? The little the splish splash. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be a rock concert, not the bleeding splish splash show. <laughs> That's all. I love the delivery of that so much. Um, <laughs> we salute you, our half inflated dark master. <laughs> But yeah, again, like going back to that idea of like there are they're like delusions of grandeur. Considering throughout the course of the film, you keep getting told that they're having shows cancelled, like left, right, yes. center, and they're playing progressively smaller and smaller venues to the point where yeah. they're they're second billing to a puppet show. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is they still have these like wild stage theatrics? Yes. Like they still think they're playing arenas, like yeah, you know, with the the infamous um eighteen eighteen inch Stonehenge model, <laughs> uh, which they have um people in costumes dancing around, <laughs> or you know where they wear robes or the, the the alien pods and stuff. It's like even though they're this like failing touring act, they still think they're these like huge arena rockers. So they have these theatrics. 
And yeah, I, love, I love that they just never give them up or they don't like think, oh, we can't use those anymore or we can't afford those yeah. anymore. Like, that's just inherently part of like what they think their music is. Yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, I, that's the shit I love in bands. Like, I love bands that have a stage show. I feel like every band should. And I think it's the, um, yeah, it's that thing of there's, there's, there's so many heavy, heavy metal bands of that era who have these elaborate campy stage theatrics, but still take themselves entirely seriously. Yeah, exactly. And again, and like, yeah. you've, got to, you've got to look at artists like, you know, like Alice Cooper, for example. He knows what he's doing is just shock. He, you know, he, yeah. He just, completely uh, embraces that. Like, he doesn't take it seriously, and that's why it works. But then, that said, Alice Cooper doesn't have absolute bangers such as Sex Farm or <laughs> Big Bottom. Uh, uh, Big Bottom <laughs> is unbelievably good. Like, that's, that's the thing, yeah, that the music is good. It's mm. I mean, lyrically, it's trash because you know the lyrics are designed to be jokes and funny. Yeah, uh, like if you know if these if these songs were made outside of uh, the film, they probably wouldn't endure because you know the lyrics are kind of garbage. Uh, it's kind of that Steel Panther thing. Well, Although I, I would say this is the thing though, I'm I'm not a huge fan of Steel Panther, and I think it's because when I look at Spinal Tap, I kind of go, the songs are so well constructed. The, some of the obviously like Big Bottom and Sex Farm are very obviously a, a joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the songs that they have, such as um, Hell Hole, which uh, I've always been a fan of, the Actual line, hanger, uh, yeah. you know, hanger. you know where you stand in a hell hole. Yeah. It's like you'd have to actually, if you heard that on the radio on Planet Rock or some other such station, you wouldn't necessarily immediately go, "Oh, that's a joke." But when you get the lyrics, like I would recommend, by the way, viewers, if if you have seen the film or if you haven't, watch it with the subtitles on. Because there are lyrical jokes that you won't catch the first time around if you don't. I'll agree with you with Hellhole because like that genuinely does sound like a song that you'd hear from some like a band like I don't know maybe like Quiet Riot or Twisted Sister. Yes. It, it sounds just like one of their songs. And if I feel like if you played that song to somebody, they would assume it was like a legit mm. song. I mean, it is because obviously they it's, spoiled that song. Uh, band. Sto- Stonehenge is the other one that always. Uh, I could see that being a Saxon song. Yeah, I liked with Stonehenge that they have like they bring in that kind of like mystical element to rock yes. which which you know was a thing uh because you know like rainbow and you know a lot of ronnie james mm. dio stuff is very much in that idea and um it immediately made me think of f is for family yes because the, the melon's son, monocle yeah uh what's uh, uh shires of frodo that's what they're called yes yeah the irish um prog rock fantasy tolkien band who <laughs> should be a real thing if you ask me uh but yeah like yeah that's the thing with sponsor it works because the music sells it that's yeah. why it works um and i think a lesser film and and in my opinion bands like steel panther they lean so hard into the the joke of it all you know and i think a lesser film would make the songs bad but what you have here is that the songs are are kind of just they are like generic 80s metal but that's kind of the point like the, this you know it, it works because although some of the songs such as sex farm are patent patently ridiculous you wouldn't they wouldn't feel out of place in certain bands' discographies, really. Uh, ab- absolutely, yeah. And I think the other thing as well, like, musically, they're very well-composed and very well-written mm. songs as well. Again, like, I mean, I, I said earlier the lyrics are trash. They they are and they aren't, I think. I think, they, you know, it's the lyrics that give them away as being joke songs yeah. as opposed to, like, b- actually being able to take them seriously as a piece of music. But, like, some of the bass work in those songs is fantastic. I was actually like, mm. watching Harry Shearer uh, while they're performing and, like, he's legitimately playing that music. I think so, it clearly comes from a place of some measure of affection. Absolutely, yeah. I don't mm. think the film is insincere about rock and metal at all. I feel no. like it's it's... I feel like those guys genuinely do have an affection for it and that shows because they they don't portray them as you know bad people they just portray them as people they're they're fucking idiots yeah and they live and the thing is they live in their own weird little bubble i think is what where most of the humor comes from it's like it's not that they're i mean they do have their prima donna-ish moments and their kind of childish spats and so forth but yeah i think what where where i feel quite affectionate towards the characters is yeah you're right none of them are necessarily bad people it's just they've been in this bizarre little world they've made for themselves for so long that they've not had to grow up, they've not had to mature. So when they are faced with like the realization that their relevance is, their time in the sun has faded, they don't really know how to deal with it. And I love one of the scenes I love that really highlights this is um, so later in the film, uh, Nigel makes a dramatic exit from the band, and there's a there's a point where Janine sets them up uh, this gig where. 
they don't have any songs prepared, so they do the Jazz Odyssey and all that. But um, the there's an exchange between uh, Derek, Harry Shearer's character, and um, David, where they dis- where uh, Derek is going to. Uh, do you know what I? Uh, people should envy us. I envy us because now we've got all this free time to explore the things that we never had time to do because we're always touring. And every single suggestion they make is fucking terrible. Yeah. So it's like the, the, <laughs> like musical, the musical, the musical about uh, Jack the Ripper. Yeah. <laughs> saucy, swear... saucy Jack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, again, I feel like even that might come from a place of affection because that immediately mm. made me think of something like Screaming Lord Such, who his entire, yeah, yeah. his entire act was he was dressed as Jack the Ripper and like killed women on stage and stuff. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I feel like there's I feel like there's a lot of deep rooted stuff in there for fans of rock and metal. Mm. I f- yeah, I think there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, and the thing that always gets me as well when we talk about the care and attention put into the parody, it is that montage early on in the film or that sequence early on in the film where you see the iterations of Tap before they were an eighties metal band. So you see them as the Thamesmen, this kind of sixties uh, rock band. And this is one of my personal favorite songs in the film, "Give Me Some Money." But when you um when you see that footage, it's such a perfect parody of the kind of 60s uh, music shows that you would have. And then it cuts to the psychedelic one and you've got all the kaleidoscopic visuals. And that's so it's so spot on to those drab TV studio kind of music shows that you used to have, like the old Grey Whistle Test and stuff like that. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, because I've seen old footage of, you know, bands like Jefferson Airplane and mm. uh, again, like Alice Cooper and stuff like, like performing on those shows. And it, yeah, it, like you say, it's completely spot on yeah. to, to like the look of those shows. And, and it's again, like, it, this is the thing. It's not like Spinal Tap wasn't a big budget movie and you know, no. it doesn't necessarily need to be. But like, it's difficult to make something look that authentic. Yeah, it's. I always find in films when they try to intentionally make a scene look like it was filmed decades previously, it, it it's really hard to get that right. I think, and they really do nail that in this movie. Like, I would believe those are real clubs. Yeah, and I think that is what sets it apart from other things in a similar vein. Is they don't go for the obvious jokes, and they do build this world of kind of believable stuff around Spinal Tap. Where, because, like, for example, I think a lesser film would have the main joke be they're bad musicians and that's kind of that. Whereas, actually, what you see in this movie is that, like, Nigel in particular appears to be kind of virtuosic on yeah. m- multiple instruments, like piano, guitar, all, all of this. Mandolin he plays at several points yeah. throughout the movie. And the thing that makes him funny is that he's just kind of an idiot like he's he's, yeah he's kind of uh, yeah that's a bump exactly where his world is so narrow and he is so not prepared for the realities of i mean he's the one who famously uh designs a stonehenge set piece to be 12 inches rather than 12 feet and um, <laughs> just such a good joke as well just a good gag guess and apparently from what i've read i need to confirm this but apparently that is partially based on something that did happen at some point yeah now you're saying that that does ring a bell but we didn't do enough research let's no i believe <laughs> i believe though there is a band out there that has said that that happened to them they ordered yeah. something like a stage prop and they, they got the measurements wrong and they were just given this tiny little thing Mm. Um, but I feel like maybe now this is the perfect time to sort of segue into the second movie because I we're going to keep coming back to Spinal Tap as we keep yes. talking about With Nail. By all um, means. So yeah, we'll go into the second film, which is With Nail and I. We've got to get some boobs. It's the only solution for this intense cold. Something's got to be done. We can't go on like this. I'm a trained actor reduced to the stakes of a bum. I mean, look at us. I think that reasonable members of society demand as their rights. No fridges, no televisions, no phones. Much more of this I'm going to apply for Meals on Wheels. What happened to your cigar commercial? That's what I want to know. What happened to my cigar commercial? What happened to my agent? Bastard must have died. September. It's a bad patch. Rubbish. I haven't seen Gilgit down the Labour Exchange. Why does he retire? So, With Nail and I tells the story of two down-and-out theatre actors who are overcome with bad luck and substance abuse, and so they decide to escape their squalid Camden flat and have a weekend break in the country at the cottage of With Nail's uncle, Monty. Only the weekend isn't nearly as relaxing as the pair had hoped, as their own self-destructive behaviours and the sudden arrival of Monty throws a spanner in the works completely. 
So that's with Nail No. That's that's what it's about. Um, I'll just start by saying that this is hands down one of my favorite films ever made. The, this is uh, very much a Mark film. Yeah, and I feel like it's so inherently suited to my sensibilities as well. Um, I think actually, to be fair, before we get into with Nail, I think we've chosen well for this inaugural podcast because Spinal Tap is very much. That is my sense of humour encapsulated in a film. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I would say, yeah, Withnail and I is very much my sort of humour. And, mm. and I, again, I feel like there's a lot of crossover in those films as well. And, I mean, it probably says a lot about us. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, m- maybe I am, uh, you know, a failed thespian living in a squalid flat. And maybe you are a washed-up rock star with delusions of grandeur. We don't know. Um, yes, they're not delusions. Uh, well, you know, we can talk about that. <laughs> you know, we'll talk about that another time. But, um, but yeah, so with Nail and I, yeah, it's a very big uh, cult favourite. Pro- possibly the biggest cult movie that Britain's ever produced, I would say. I mean, there might be something else. I mean, I, I, well, actually, you no, know, I mean, technically, Rocky Horror Picture Show is British. British-ish. British-American. It was a British stage yeah. show made in Britain, but financed by an American company. Um I think Withnail is very British in its um, sensibilities and its uh, cynicism and humour, yeah. Yeah, because I see, you know, at the start of the movie, you have Withnail, who's played by Richard E. Grant. Also, I'm uh, just going to slip in a little bit of trivia here. I only found this out today, that apparently uh, Daniel Day-Lewis was originally offered the role of Withnail. Oh, wow, really? But turned it down. Different movie, though. Different movie. Yeah, and honestly, as much as I'm like, you know, obviously, because Daniel Day-Lewis is just fucking incredible in everything he's in mm. I, I richard e grant is perfect for whiff now like he every single inflection in his voice is perfect for that character i think it's hard to imagine anyone else playing that role yeah same with same with paul mcgann as as and i um but mm. for the for ease of us talking about it we'll actually use his name because he does have a name his name is marwood which uh you only they never actually say his name in the movie hence why the movie is called Withnail and i um, you only know his name because he receives a letter towards the end of the movie and it says his name on For the sake of us talking about it, instead of just constantly calling him and I, we should just call him Marwood, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, because at the start of the movie, Withnail and Marwood, and it's not fully explained at first, but they've been awake for 70 hours taking speed. Yes. So they're, they're on like the come down of, you know, they're just coming down and they live in this disgusting Camden flat. And the yes. entire movie is based around Marwood realizing that him and Withnail are actually in this sort of, you know, arrested state. They're not, they're just, they're stagnating. And they're yes. not getting any work. And so, you know, at the start of the movie, whilst he's coming down, we have Marwood um, saying, you know, in his uh, internal narration saying, I have to go talk to Withnail about his problems right away. <laughs> and we're immediately introduced to Withnail, who comes out of his bedroom drinking the remains of a bottle of wine and just asking Marwood what they're going to do because they no longer have any wine. And I feel like that sets the movie up perfectly because we see that Marwood um, knows that his situation is bad and wants to get out of it, whereas Withnail is more than fine to just continue on his you know, rampant drug and alcohol abuse binge that he's clearly been on for a very long time. Yeah, um... I think it's quite because uh, I've I've not seen it as often as you have. I think I've maybe seen it um, two or three times, mm-hmm. uh, with with last night being the the third. And the thing that struck me this time is um, God, yeah, and it's interesting you saying about Danny Day Lewis actually being in it because you can see this very much as a comedy, or you can see it as quite a bleak character study, really. Oh, it, it's incredibly bleak. This is the thing about with Nail and I. This is why I'm always so amazed by it. it's like popularity even though obviously you know, it's such a well-made film well acted and well written and all that like it's because even though it is funny it's incredibly bleak and incredibly depressing in places yeah and really really fucking mean-spirited as well like with nail is not a nice person at all no no and um yeah i think it's really uh, as an interesting kind of counterpoint to spinal tap where we have uh characters who are kind of in the decline of their career. What we have with with Nell and Marwood is characters who are who have not yet really embarked on their career. And in fact, as we end the movie, Marwood is kind of starting his as the yeah. indication. And yet Withnail has delusions of grandeur because yes. he believes that he is, you know, destined to play the lead and he believes that he is going to be the you know the greatest thing to happen to theatre since forever. Well, I was going to ask you about this. How much do we think Withnell actually believes 
the egotistical stuff that comes out of his mouth. Because he's always screaming about, like, oh, I mean, there's a bit where he's kind of, uh, they've just had an interaction with the poacher, I think, who kind of fobs them off. Mm. And uh, he's screaming on the moors about, I'm going to be a fucking star and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, about how to take the bastard axe to him, which is a great line. But yeah, I was wondering about this. How much do we think Withnell really believes in all of that? I feel like he has to believe it. Because otherwise, what else has he got? Yeah, I think maybe... I suppose my read on that is, like, he believes it up until the point where, at the end of the movie, Marwood actually gets a, an acting job and, and leaves the insular little man-boy bubble that they've created for themselves. S- spoilers, but uh, these films are, over, are like almost 40 years old, who cares? I mean... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spoilers for Withnell and I. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, good, yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shocking spoilers there. But yeah, no, it's, yeah, so towards the end of the movie, Marwood uh, does get a job and he does leave the the flat because you kind of have this circular thing in the movie where they start off in their dingy little flat in London, yep. go off to the country for the majority of the film, yeah. and then come back to London for a little bit at the end. And basically you have a scene where Marwood is, is given... Well, he's he's um, we learn when they're in the country, he's won a part right or they're considering yeah, him for yeah. a part in a play Yeah, because prior to the start of the movie he's had an audition which they mentioned quite a lot throughout the film yes and then it turns out they yes when they get back to london it turns out they didn't want him for the part he auditioned for they want him for the lead in the play and that's a really interesting scene because uh we go from with now being kind of his usual self and just smoking weed and being a, a, a terror basically to this very kind of immediate change where he's look as soon as Marwood says, "Oh, they they don't want me for the part I auditioned for. They won't want me for the lead." There's an instant change in his mood, and I almost feel like this time watching, I was almost like, "Oh, this is the point where his bubble of delusion bursts," and he's like, "This little world that I built up for myself, wherein I am a star or a potential star who is being unduly set to one side by the acting community," and you get the sense that. Whatever acting roles Withnell has had in his career, he's he's probably been an absolute terror to work with. Let's be oh, absolutely, honest. yeah. He because like at one point in the movie, his agent offers him the chance to understudy Constantine, and yes. he immediately refuses it because he refuses to be an understudy because he believes he should be the lead. And then yes. he goes on a little rant about how he hates Russian plays because he thinks they're all about just women talking about birds flying to Moscow. And stuff. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Which you know is not too far from the truth. Uh, <laughs> but I think whilst he has Marwood with him, and Marwood also has no prospects, while he has that, he has someone who kind of validates his view of himself and his world. Absolutely, yeah. And I feel like this is the thing. When I first saw Withnail and I, I loved it for the humour and, you know, the characters. But, like, the more I watch it, the more I actually kind of see what's going on beneath it. Because I was uh, written and directed by uh, Bruce Robinson. We should have probably mentioned that earlier. Yes. Uh, but based upon Bruce Robinson's life. Uh, yes. He was, yeah, he was a jobbing actor in uh, the 60s in London. And uh, Withnail is actually based on a real person who uh, died uh, prior to the movie being made, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, we should probably um, we should probably mention. I believe that gentleman uh, committed suicide. Yeah, he he apparently mm. he was very much Withnail as he is depicted in the movie. Mm. Uh, and the, the he, original the original ending of the movie was that you would see Withnail um, commit suicide. Yes, uh, which I'm really really actually glad is not in the movie because yes. I, I feel like the ending is very downbeat, but there is a, a sense of optimism. And I was actually about to mention this because um, you were talking about like the moment at the end where Marwood uh, gets off at the part. You see the bubble burst for Withnail, and I completely agree that's what happened. Uh, but it's the final scene of the movie where they're drinking the bottle of wine, walking through the park, and Marwood basically tells Withnail he doesn't want him to walk any further with him. He, you know, he's basically telling Withnail he doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. Yes, and very pointedly, Marwood isn't drinking the wine at that point. Yes, he isn't. Yeah, he's Withnail like... repeatedly offers it to him. But... Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then Marwood leaves, and then we have the scene where uh, Mar- uh, Withnail performs the Shakespearean speech. I don't uh, know ha- what... uh, Hamlet. Is it Hamlet? Yeah. 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 What a piece of work is man. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, he performs it in the rain with the bottle of wine in his hand to the wolves that are in the enclosure in the park. And it kind of proves to you that Withnell can act. And he mm. is good. And I feel like that you can kind of read that ending in different ways. You can read it as 
maybe this bubble bursting has kind of allowed him to actually perform as he, his talents allow him to, or he's now determined to actually make something of himself because Marwood's left him. Yeah. But also, they're being kicked out of their flat by the end of the movie, so, you know, Wiffnell's kind of got no choice but to make it work, I guess. I suppose that's probably why in the original film he does top himself. Yeah, I think it's interesting, because I, I don't really know where I fall on what I think happens after the credits roll. Um, I can't. Uh, there's part of me that can't really imagine Withnell getting his shit together. No, um, I get the feeling he dosses around with Danny and presuming Ed for the rest of time. <laughs> yeah, so they should um, probably mention there's some wonderful characters who were... Uh, who are part of the the, the London uh, sort of setting of the film? Uh, Danny, the sort of uh, Cockney Ooh. drug dealer, is my favourite character mm. in the movie. Uh, also, yeah, it's like uh, Ralph, Ralph Brown is such an underrated actor. Yeah, he is. He's fantastic, and I I love that tone of voice he has in this. And um, he's in Wayne's World too as well. He has that tone yeah, of voice yeah. that that perfectly kind of. Um, this is a it's a very British thing. So if we have listeners yeah. not from Britain, they won't know this kind of person. But that is sort of cockney londoner with that slightly patronizing tone of voice to everything they say you know it's always yeah be seated you know <laughs> yes. uh, it was the line about I... the, the camberwell carrot yeah I, I invented it in camberwell and it resembles a carrot it's you just know? yeah he's danny like is just every single line of dialogue he has mm. like um, i like his little anecdote about um how uh hair are your aerials that give you signals <laughs> yes. from the cosmos. This is why bald men are uptight. Yes, uh, yes. And he, I love how he follows that on later where he's talking about the landlord giving him shit and he's like, yeah, he came on all bald with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a very subtle little line that I always like. Yeah, yeah. Um, came but... on all bald with me. He also has a wonderful speech towards the end. God, oh, about the end of the 60s. Yes, because obviously the movie's set in 69, 69, correct? yeah, it's set in yeah. 69. So it's kind of the end of um, a certain era of London as well. Um, and I know that there's a lot of films, um, you know, set in America around that time period that kind of deal with... Uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is a classic example. And um, Which, you know, does have its... Fear and Loathing is very intrinsically tied with Whiff Now and I as well, because Bruce Robinson uh, did The Rum Diaries, which is... Of course, um, yeah, of course. I didn't even think Thompson, of that. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of sort of similarities i think with her but with there's that Thompson kind of speech right, yeah. in that um which is directly from the book of fear and loathing which is kind of a of a similar note where hunter s thompson's kind of talking about um you know the 60s as being a, a the end of a crest of a wave and all you know i can't remember the exact wording but it's very similar to the speech that danny gives about um God, I can't. Can you get the quote up? Because I can't remember the quote, and I want. It's, it's what he is it because he discusses the the idea that they're now selling hippie wigs in Woolworths. Yes, that is one of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, talk about how uh, this decade's coming to an end, and there's going to be a lot of refugees. Is you know what he talks about. Yes, great, yes. Great, that was... Greatest decade in human history has come to an end. Like I should know that. I've watched the film more times than I could count, so I probably should know it. But uh, um... I've got Danny quotes up here, so let's see if we can find it. <laughs> Honestly, he is the best character in the movie. He really is. Like, as much as I love everything else about it, Danny just cracks me up every time. Okay, so I've got the exact quote, because I do want to get this right. So Danny says, uh, Politics, man, if you're hanging on to a rising balloon, you're presented with a difficult question. Let go before it's too late, or hang on and keep getting higher. Posing the question, how long can you grip onto the rope? They're selling hippie wigs in Woolworths, man. The greatest decade in the history of mankind is over. And as presuming Ed here has so consistently pointed out, <laughs> we have failed to paint it black. Um, which is just glorious dialogue as well yeah and that is um from the mouth of a, a fairly full well a fairly silly character really but it's that i feel that that kind of encapsulates with nail as well because that is that 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 line about if you're hanging on to a rising balloon you can only get higher or let go it's, it's very, very indicative of marvel yeah. isn't it like it's very much about him hmm Mm. And again, I think this is the thing about Withnell that I truly, truly love about it. Again, it's similar with Spartan, like there's a lot of layers to Withnell and I. Yes. Like, on the surface, it's a, a fairly bleak black comedy about, you know, two pissheads and their exploits in the country. But it's kind of, there's a lot more going on, particularly in like the characters. And like you say, the Danny speech at the end really just kind of speak about like what, like the time period that these characters are living in and how it reflects their own lives. Mm. Um, and also, like, it's amazing how authentically... I mean, obviously, we weren't alive in the 60s, so we can't necessarily no. speak for how authentic it is, but how authentically 60s it looks. Well, I was watching the film with my partner last night, and um, she'd never seen it before. Um, she didn't care for it, unfortunately. But, oh, okay. um, I was going to ask But she, she actually asked a few points, and was like, uh, when was this film made? 
because obviously it's got Richard E. Grant and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Paul, Paul McGann, McGann in it. But she, she was like, it seems like it's actually from the 60s. And yeah. I think part of that is that it's shot on pretty shoddy film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was an extreme, extremely low-budget movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, funded, uh, was, was handmade films, which was George Harrison's. It was Russian indeed, company. yes. Um, yes, they also financed uh, t- uh, Time Bandits. Because I remember the first time I became aware of With Mel and I, was uh, was uh, the advert at the start of the VHS copy of Time Bandits that my dad had? Oh really? See the yeah, way yeah. that um, the way that I came across with them, I was actually weirdly the same way I came across this as Spinal Tap. Okay. Um, you you might remember these actually. They they were they were a thing for a while, and I feel like the internet has kind of taken them and they've become something else now. But there was a point in like the early two thousands where uh, a lot of TV channels, particularly like BBC and Channel Four, would do these really fucking long shows that would be like. 100 greatest comedy movies or something like yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, they yes, did, yes. They did loads yeah. of those. And I, I feel like this that they're partially responsible for the reason why I have such fucking encyclopedic knowledge of all this stuff. Yeah, I, 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 do you know what? I'm, I'm going to say, I hadn't really thought about it until now, but I think, I yeah, those uh, those Channel 4 um, specials, whatever you want to call them, definitely influenced me. Yeah, because like you would hear about so much stuff on them that you would never mm. you never hear about. Like I remember, I think the one that I remember the most um, is the 100 greatest scary moments that they did for Halloween, and that was that was over the course of two nights. I think it was like a six and a half hour long show, and it was just them basically showing you a hundred clips from horror movies and TV shows. And like I heard about so many films I never heard of before. This might be why that. this might be the origin story of why you and I are so fond of ranking things. Absolutely. Yeah. We often yeah. have uh, Facebook conversations and real life <laughs> conversations that just consist of us ranking things. I yeah. think the most recent <laughs> epic one we did uh, was during the uh, furlough, just dating the podcast, um, oh, yeah. where we were discussing the best episodes of The Simpsons. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I do that kind of thing a lot with people. I imagine mm. we'll probably end up doing it on the show at some point. But um, yeah, I've, I. Oh, oh, we, we also ranked all the Marvel films. Don't we, we did. Yeah. What, what was the what was the rating criteria on the Marvel movies? We will get back to talking about with now in a second. I can't remember off the top of my head now, but there were some like, controversial. There were some controversial ones. I think it was something like I'm pretty sure it was uh, love it shit and like. Uh, well, we normally go by like we that. normally go by love it shit shit by love it or no <laughs> yeah. opinion or no maybe, opinion. Maybe that should be our grading criteria. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got well, at the end of the episode. We can decide, I guess. We, can, we yeah. I, I just but, want the listeners to know that Mark is one of these weak people who doesn't think Iron Man three is a masterpiece. Uh, go on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. That's on another time. We'll talk about that sometime because I will stand by that movie sucks. Anyway, absolute uh, Chad cinema. Oh, fucking awful. Any song that's any. Uh, sorry. Any film that starts with I uh, fucking I'm blue. Fuck that. No. Is a masterpiece. End wrong, of discussion. Wrong. Wrong. Iron Man two is better. There you go. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about Iron Man. Uh, I've already caused controversy, I know. This, this is the spiciest um, thing we've said all, all podcast. <laughs> yeah, the rest of it's just us sucking off our favourite films. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's the way I heard about With Dale and I and Spinal Tap. Was, uh, Channel 4 did like 100 greatest comedy movies, and both of them were in the top 10. I can remember that specifically. Oh, as they um, should be, yes. Yeah, I... If I remember correctly, I can't remember what position Spinal Tap was at, but I definitely remember, I think, With Nail and I was like number three. Or something like, like oh really, wow, okay, really near the top end. So that's um, interesting because I wouldn't say that when I watch with Nell and I that I'm necessarily laughing out loud throughout the film. There's lines that get. Don't get me wrong. It, I, I, it's the kind of thing where I know it's funny and I do chuckle throughout. But I wouldn't say there's anything that makes me. Whereas Spinal Tap, I laugh like a drain from start to finish. I, I feel like it's because Spinal Tap has like punchlines and a lot more setup, whereas I feel yeah. like the humour in With Nail and I more just comes from the despair of it all. Um, yeah, it's situational humour more so. Yeah, than, you yeah. know, and, they, Gags. and yeah, and yeah, there are there are moments in With Nail that always make me laugh, but it's the sort of thing where, like, I love the the scene at the beginning where they're both like coming down off speed and um, <laughs> Marwood is uh, drinking coffee with a spoon and a, from a from a bowl with a spoon. Because yes. the, the because the kitchen is so disgusting. That they, like, yeah, they I do like, like the references to the uh, the filth of the kitchen. Yeah, it's the it's the like the line that Whiffnell has where um, Marwood's going to reach into the sink and he's just like, "Don't attempt anything without the gloves." Like, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Or when like he thinks something's alive in there, so Whiffnell's like, "Here, get it with the pliers." You know, it's 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 those are the things I find funny. And Danny, of course, Danny is just infinitely yeah, hilarious. Danny is amazing. Um, yeah, and just a little tidbit of information for the listeners' benefit. Uh, if you're a fan of Peep Show, uh, Danny is apparently the main inspiration for the character of Superhands. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, and again, you can complete it. And again, I feel like Peep Show in, it, in, in itself has an, uh, elements of Whiffnell and I generally. Um, I think they, I, they have similar DNA, definitely. I've, and I know for a fact that um, both Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss said that Whiffnell and I was quite a big uh, influence on their version of Sherlock. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'd heard that. I was even saying to my partner as we were watching it last night that um, I feel like some of the scenes in the flat are what happens in Sherlock when they are not on a case. Yeah, literally, <laughs> and I, like, particularly like Benedict Cumberbatch kind of has some shades of Richard E. Grant in that. Definitely, role, definitely, yeah. yeah. And I, you, yeah, and again, like Mar- uh, Martin Freeman plays uh, Watson very much like mm. Paul McGann plays Marwood. I think, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, go, so going back to Whiffnell now, I can't remember where we were. Um, we've sort of been trailing off a little bit and sort of lost track of where we were going so where were we with nail night arrested development um well uh i think what we can say about with nail and i that's kind of similar to spinal tab is like is that idea of these kind of um slightly uh we've said arrested development these these slightly kind of boy men anarchic personalities kind of living in their own weird little bubble um, yeah, with Nell portrays it as much more tragic than uh, Spinal Tap. Yeah, because in Spinal Tap they're out on tour, so like you know their bubbles are like you know hotel rooms and stuff. Whereas mm. in With Nell it's this disgusting flat. And I think with Spinal uh, Tap as well, you get the sense that the, the, there isn't the kind of parasitic relationship in um, that there is in With Nell. Like they kind of you get the sense that these guys would be friends whether they were in a band or not. You know, whereas with With Nell and I, it's kind of. You, you can see how much being around each other is dragging these two guys down. And I feel like, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing we've been talking about with Noel for this long without mentioning Uncle Monty. Yes, I was just about to say, actually, uh, we've, we've not mentioned Monty yeah. at all, the terrible cunt. Which, yes, the terrible cunt himself, uh, mm. played just so beautifully uh, by Richard Griffiths. The one and only, yes. Honestly, my fav- hands down my favourite performance of hers. Probably would say the same about Richard E. Grant and Paul McGann as well. I feel like this is, th- for those three, this is absolutely their best work. This is definitely them at their most iconic, I would say. Yeah. And mm. uh, and again, like, with looking at Whiffnell and, like, because Whiffnell is a terrible person, like, mm. or at least the actions of his that we see in the movie, he's a, he's a horrible person. He's very opportunist, uh, opportunistic, uh, very much was willing to take advantage of people. He's willing to lie to get what he wants. And... You know, like we get that in the whole idea that the reason why they get Uncle Monty's cottage is because what and what we don't know at the time is that Whiffnell has lied to Monty because Monty is uh, Monty is a, a gay man um, yes. who's obviously been living in secrecy. He's very also very lecherous, um, mm. and uh, yeah. So Whiffnell tells Monty that Marwood is gay, and if they have the country, uh, the cottage in the country for the weekend, Monty can come up and quite literally have his way with Marwood. Yes. Which, is to even though as much as I love the movie and I've seen it several times, I still find that so fucking morally repugnant. <laughs> it's just yeah, so gross. It's such a it's an interesting one that, isn't it? Because it's such a repulsive thing to do. And Monty the way Monty pursues it is so wrong. Yeah, like again, like there are definitely elements about with Nell and I that have uh, in the modern day are a little bit much, let's say. Um, <laughs> like, like Monty's pursuit of Marwood is predatory. Let's put it that way. Well, he does even uh, say he has the line about um, "I must have you, even if it must be burglary," which you know is shocking, frankly. Um, yes. And again, I feel like you know not going too far down that angle because there's there's definitely a lot that you could discuss about like the way that Monty is portrayed as being like homosexual and stuff in the movie. And I don't really think we should touch on that because that's a whole fucking can of worms. I think we should. Let's touch on it. Um, I'm gonna say. I, I'm just going to put my two cents in here. All right, okay, we're going down that route. Let's go. Um, I think you have to bear in mind the time that the movie is set in. Yeah. I think that overall, the film is sympathetic towards Monty, whilst also portraying his actions as repugnant, as you say. But then, but then again, he, he is dissuaded. That, he is dissuaded when Marwood says, oh, with now bent the truth there, we're actually a couple. Yes, that's how he manages to save himself from yeah. Monty's advances by lying. By and again, like this is the other thing that Marwood is clearly a very good actor because he's able to convince Monty that him and Whiffnell have been a couple for years. Uh, I know a lot of people do kind of a wonder whether or not um, 
Whiffnell and Marwood are actually gay. I know there's a, there's a lot of discussion around that. I've never really interpreted it that way myself. I don't think they they have sex, but I think they are they are at a level where there is a lot. This is actually something I had in my notes because um, there is a bit where Monty kind of. Um, I forget the line. I should have written the line down. But where Monty kind of compares them to being sort of like a like an old married couple or something like this, and um, that's obviously what part of the humor is that they are they do have that relationship of this kind of bickering duo who who know each other so well they know how to get under each other's skin in that in that way that you often see with uh, with older couples perhaps or, or older couples who maybe should have broken up a long time ago. Um, you definitely see that kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't. I don't think you're supposed to infer that they're homosexual, as they say in the film. Yeah. But um, there's definitely y- some kind of deeper relationship. Yes, there that the fact that not, they, we're not privy to. We repeatedly see them sharing a bed as well. As one. As one. Thing. Yeah. Um, and um, I was also going to say the ending, where Marwood does leave. The way that it's shot and framed is very much. In the way like that you a melodrama, yeah, in the way that you'd show a, a lover leaving, and it's even the cliche of like he's going to the train station, he's going to take a train yeah, and disappear yeah. out of and with Snow's the life. And, yeah, 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 so I, I think I think that subtext is definitely there. Obviously, we never really know whether Withnell is is gay, straight, or what. Really, he's just kind of. Well, neither of them neither of them talk about women really no. throughout the course of the movie. We can infer so. that Marwood probably isn't gay from the way he refers to gay people. Yes, his, his attitude <laughs> towards Monty definitely uh, yes. cements that, I think. So um, I think it's really interesting, because Marwood is supposedly Bruce Robinson's self-portrait of him at the time. Marwood is very much a man of his time in his attitudes towards gay men and towards... Uh, he even has the line about when... Um, uh, what's the fellow called? Uh, Danny's mate. Oh, Presuming Ed. Presuming Ed. When, he find, when he, they come home to find yes. Presuming Ed in the, in the bath, he has the line about... Who is the huge spade in the bath? We understand that that's them capturing the language of the time, and I don't. Yeah. I don't think that Marwood is necessarily hateful towards presuming Ed in any way, but like that is something that um, I think is really, really honest of Bruce Robinson yeah. as well to, yeah. to kind of capture those attitudes. From what I gather as well, Monty is uh, apparently he's semi based on uh, a very lecherous director that Bruce Robinson worked with. Okay who was known to get very handsy with actors. And uh, they actually refer to that earlier in the movie as well, when uh, Whiffnell reads about an actor getting a, a new role in a play. Yes. He speculates that the only reason the guy got the part is because he's literally letting the director shag him. Yeah, the, the closest thing, actually, speaking of um, Whiffnell's sexuality, the closest thing we get to him discussing women in any way is him drunkenly shouting at some teenage schoolgirls call them scrubbers yeah. yes and then as the uh, marwood drives hastily on going they love it those tats yeah that's true actually yeah i think that probably is the closest you get to that kind of thing and even that seems to be more about him you know being as obnoxious as possible yeah yeah um i do feel like um monty is a good way of gauging like with nails um Again, like it's, it's delusions of grandeur and stuff. Mm. In that, because there's a line that I think that's quite important in the movie where, um, when he f- they first go over to Uncle Monty's house and they're having drinks and uh, they're both just openly lying to Monty about their careers, yes, and stuff. yes. And um, Monty asks where Marwood was educated, and uh, Richard E. Grant says, uh, he went to the other place, yes, to which to which Monty says, ah, an Etonian, yeah. So the idea is obviously there then that, um, both Monty and Whiffnell, I'm assuming, have gone to Harrow. Yes. And looking at Monty's house, Monty's clearly not short of a few bob. His no, house yeah, so it's definitely... Um, and this is a point, actually, uh, early on in the film, they, um, when they're kind of hard up in the flat, uh, Ma would just say, why don't you call your father for some money? Which Whiffnell dismisses immediately. Yeah, because he wants to prove that he is this, you know, this incredible, talented actor, and you know, he's always wondering where his cigar commercial went. And uh, yeah, I think it's the very um, it's very telling that of Withnell's presumably extended knobby family, it's Uncle Monty that he gravitates towards. Yeah, yeah, completely. Because and also because this is the thing, like Marwood is kind of correct when he refers to Monty as being a raving madman, because yes. Mo- Monty's not all there. Like, no, they they not. openly take advantage of him several times throughout the movie, and you know Marwood does as well. Like you know he they. They very much like take advantage of him uh, because they know that he's this, you know, lonely, has been repressed for a long time gay man who's suffering 
and growing, you know, firm young carrots in his house and trying to kill his cat. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Monty's got a couple of screws loose. Yeah, the, I do. It does. Uh, yeah, the the vitriol he has towards his cat is very funny to me. Yeah, uh, just yeah, his little speech about root crops and stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, and I feel like that's that's very telling of Whiff now. I feel like you know he's clearly grown up, um, you know, surrounded by money and had his head filled with the idea that he can do anything because of his status. And you know, as as he so famously says in the movie, "I'm a trained actor reduced to the states of a bum," because his development hasn't gone further than that. He's had everything handed to him all of his life. Yeah, and he's never known how to work for anything. And whereas you get the sense that Marwood is the opposite, because I, you know, obviously he lies and tells him that he went to. I'm assuming he, t- he lies by telling him he went to Eton. Um, yeah, well, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. That one always... Because um, Marwood doesn't strike me as uh, being particularly from money, necessarily. No, I get the feeling he's a bit more working class than that. Mm. Or, or at least not, you know, to the manner born. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't sound working class, let's be honest. No, no, of course. But I feel <laughs> like maybe that, again, is why he does you know use kind of like discriminatory language towards people and stuff Mm. because his background is a little bit more working class than that and he's Mm. kind of gotten into this world and you know he's become friends with Whiffnail who even though he's in this world is a raging alcoholic yeah and you know misuser of drugs and stuff um but yeah I feel like comparing the two films um yeah this is Spinal Tap is a, a lot more hopeful and a lot more you know, there's kind of a bit more joy to this is Spinal Tap, because especially when you get to the end, because you know, they find out their song Sex Farm has gone to number five in Japan, so yes. they go to Japan to do a tour, and clearly, like, you know, they've, they're still living inside that bubble that they've created for themselves, but they've now finally found a place where that bubble is, you know, people want what they have to offer, and they've, they've and found they their place. And they seem to have somewhat, even though uh, at the end of Spinal Tap, when they are playing in Japan, you do see that both Janine and Ian are watching them from the side of the stage. And Ian looks very smug about things because he set up this Japanese tour. You get the sense that the boys are a little bit more in control of their strange little bubble now. Because it is Nigel who comes to David and says, after they've broken up and says, you know, we could get the band back together and go to Japan if you want. And then initially David kind of flubs him off. But then you see, um, you know, whilst they're playing on stage still in America... He's the one who beckons Nigel onto the stage. Yeah, and I, I love that moment. Mm. I think that's so nice. Like that's uh, that's very telling of those two characters. Yeah, that, I and I think that's um, that that's a sharp contrast to Withnell and I, where essentially the bubble bursts and Withnell is kind of left to fend him for himself, more or less. Yeah, which I feel like uh, I noticed it this time around as well. That's the other thing about this movie. I tend to notice new things about it every time I watch it because mm. we discussed this slightly earlier. Where if you've never seen Withnell and I before and you watch it for the first time, it can be a little bit hard to keep up with what the characters are actually talking about in yes. places because the way that because the dialogue is very wordy uh very of its time and as well you, euphemistic as well yeah yeah like they, they use a lot of phrases that aren't around anymore and mm. uh, the way that like characters tell stories or the the way they um put their feelings across is just not how people would these days or how many people would anyway also if i may level a, a slight complaint at the film the sound mix is bollocks Oh, it's terrible. I, I was, yeah. I mean, I I watched it yesterday. Oh, sorry, the day. Yeah, I watched it yesterday. I did. Mm. Furlo, man, losing track of time. Uh, I watched it yesterday, and I watched the Arrow video release of it. I've got the Blu-ray, um, which also comes with um, the other film that Bruce Robinson and Richard E. Grant did, uh, How to Get Ahead in Advertising, which I've never watched. Yeah, I've never seen that either. Um, I'd, I'd be I'd be interested to watch it because you know, same team behind this. Uh, but yeah, they've cleaned up the soundtrack a little bit on the Arrow release, but it's still pretty bad i had to constantly fluctuate the volume on my tv to to, like, to be able to hear certain scenes which yeah. is very annoying but the picture quality is great so you know can't mm. you know, trade off i guess um i forgot where i was going with this oh yeah so it was all about the language and stuff yeah um so yeah, it can be kind of hard to know what they're actually talking about in places and i watched it with my housemate for the first time and i could definitely tell there were moments where i was laughing at jokes that he probably didn't get the gist of because obviously i've seen the film so many times yeah. i know what they're talking about yeah, yeah. and i think that that is if I have to have two complaints about with Nell and I, it would be, yeah, the sound mix is kind of dire in places and the the, the dialogue could be a little impenetrable to some people, mm. I think. I think that's part of it, though, because I think it's portraying this these people, whether it's with Nell, Marwood or, or Monty, or even Danny, who just kind of exist in their own reality. And they are, and in their minds, everything they say is of great importance, you know. And the Absolutely. things that they're saying are poetry, you know. And yeah, 
Again, they're all like you know, they're all thespians and poets and you know, weird beat poets and all that. Weird yeah, stylists. All, all well, that's it because Danny's that classic example of the guy who sort of knows everyone in the artistic community because he knows how to get drugs. Like that, because like you get the sense that uh, presuming Ed is, is something, right? He's doing something. Presuming Ed is also the one who uh, Danny wants to go into business with, uh, making dolls. Going to yes. make a doll that shits itself, which is one of my favourite jokes in the film. Well, well just uh, <laughs> on the subject of Danny, one of my other favourite lines is when they, uh, when Withnell and Marwood return and find presuming Ed and and Danny have taken up residence in the flat, basically. Uh, they get they actually go. Um, I, I believe as uh, Marwood turns to Danny, he goes, "Danny, how the hell did you get in here?" And he just goes, "Oh, Jimmy up the drain pipe and through the window." <laughs> He's just such an opportunist, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's so indicative of everyone that surrounds Marwood in the film. They're all trying to leech something off him, whether it's simply Absolutely. four walls and a roof, or whether in Withnell's case, it's it's an audience essentially, um, and in, obviously in, in in Monty's case, it's a tight warm bum hole but um <laughs> and on that note i feel like we should probably wrap up because uh, we've uh, we've been talking for a while um but the, the last thing i kind of want to say before we give our sort of final thoughts on the movies and whether or not we recommend them is uh one uh, obviously there's so many similarities between these two movies that yes. there's a lot of stuff that i wrote down that we didn't even talk about yeah i've mostly been free balling it to be honest i wrote a lot of notes but yeah 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 i think we like i've looked back on my notes and we've at some point touched on most of the things mm. i want to talk about but one of the most interesting coincidences about the film uh, both films, should I say, is that they were both directorial debuts. Oh, I hadn't quite put that together, actually. Yeah, yeah. Rob, Rob Reiner, that was his first... Spinal okay. Tap was his first movie, and Bruce Robinson... Yeah, of course uh, it would be, yeah, actually, movies. of course it would be, yeah, because then, uh, yeah. Because obviously Rob Reiner goes on to do all sorts of things, like When Harry Met Sally and Princess Bride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All sorts. Yeah, yeah, there's a... Yeah, literally, yeah. So they're both directorial debuts, and they're such strong debuts, like such mm. strong films that really kind of have their own identities. Um, they're really competently made films, I mean, apart from Withnell's audio. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, low budget movie, and you know, you, you kind of have to expect these things, I guess. With Spinal Tap being a, a mockumentary about a rock band, you can tell obviously a lot of thought went into the, the audio side of it, so that works quite well. And they're all, they're both kind of the correct length as well, which is something that I'll yeah. talk about a lot in future episodes as films. Oh, absolutely, too long, too yeah, because well, Spinal Tap's not even 90 minutes. It's, yeah, it's like 80, 85 or something like that. It's, yeah, it's and, uh, so with no brief. And I... Yeah, Withnell and I is 107, so it's mm. you know it's only 10 minutes longer than your standard film, and I feel like they're both very well paced. Um, yeah. they both have that same style that I spoke about earlier, where they because like both films have a plot, it feels more like a series of vignettes and sketches and ideas and yeah, they're they're you know. both character studies more so than plot driven. Yeah, because in Withnell and I, like, what's the plot of Withnell and I? Two like washed out actors go to the country, shit goes wrong, they come back. Mm. they part ways like that's the story in a nutshell uh, but it's the things that happen along the way and like the weird interactions that they have with people that make it funny like when you know they they decide to go fishing <laughs> and their version of fishing is with now standing in the stream with a gun shooting the fish <laughs> you know <laughs> like, um but yeah so how we need to obviously assign these films our little ratings and stuff yeah so, so yes this is spinal tap what do you reckon kino or inferno absolute 100 percent kino it's a fantastic film it's so funny so enjoyable especially for people like us that love you know the rock music and stuff it's just it's just a fucking great movie yeah i'm um, right there with you I, I i i'm not even gonna mess about it. it's just kino it's one of the yeah. funniest films ever made one of the greatest casts ever assembled for a comedy just absolutely incredibly well done detail oriented humor as well like like i say it's a film that i've seen in the upwards of 10 times and every time it's just as funny even if i don't laugh in the same places there's there's joke after joke it is that thing of you can you should rewatch it because there'll be things you didn't get the first time yep and you know if we then assign our ratings to with now and i i pretty much my opinion is exactly what you've just said about spinal tap mm, i've yeah. watched it so many times i still find it just as good every time i see it there are jokes that are not apparent the first time you watch it uh it's great performances just yeah, I mean, with no life for me, pure Kino. Can't recommend that film enough. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna have to go Kino with this, that one as well. I've not seen it as often as you have, but I definitely will watch it multiple times in the future. I would think it's one that I I, I don't think. I mean, uh, this is kind of personal taste issues, but I wouldn't necessarily watch it as often as something like Spinal Tap, 
because I think there is something there's something about with Mel and I that which I love, but it's very very bleak and it's kind of yeah, it's very um, it's it's bracing in some ways. Yeah, I, I get yeah. that. I feel like yeah, you, it's it's very much a film that you have to be in the mood for. Um, it just so happens that I tend to be in the mood for it quite a lot. Yes, yes. Um, I think prior to watching it this time, uh, it wasn't the last time I saw it because uh, that was that wasn't too long ago actually. Um, the time I saw it before that, um, I ended up watching it twice in a week. Oof, nice. Purely because uh, somebody I knew hadn't seen it. Mm. And so I showed it to them, and then I ended up having an impromptu gathering at my house. This was pre-COVID, obviously. Yes. Um, I had a, an impromptu gathering at my house, and about four of the people that were there, because we were all having drinks, they were like, oh, well, I've never seen Whiff now, and I. So I was like, do you want to watch it? So I watched it twice in a week. <laughs> well, they're both, uh, they both definitely have that quality of the films that are fun to show other people, even if you've seen them yourself. Absolutely, like one of my one of my good friends, uh, Mr. James Smiley. So shout out to him. He's going to have to watch the show and it will listen to the show now, should I say? Because uh, I've name dropped him. Uh, when I first met him, uh, that was Wifner and I was the thing that we bonded over. Um, he just said a quote from it out of nowhere, and I was like, right, okay, me and this guy can be friends because he gets Wifner and I. Turns out as well, the pub that they go to prior to the um, the tea room scene. Yes. Uh, that's just near where his parents live. Oh, they, right. actually have, okay. they actually have a, a placard from with the shot from the movie yeah, nice. uh, when we whilst we were visiting um his hometown he was going to take me there but sadly we couldn't which was a shame but we're planning on going there at some point which would yeah, be nice yeah, it's nice. nice to have a pint in the pub from with now no i completely get you if, if some if i'm in conversation with someone and they kind of spit out a spinal tap reference i sort of know you know i, I found i found one of my people <laughs> especially if it, especially if it's a niche one <laughs> So there you go then, with Nail Nine Spinal Tap, both certified yeah. Keno. Unco- uncontroversial movie. review there, I think. Keno. Yeah. But, you know, it was our first time, we felt like it was probably worth us talking about things that we love. Yes. Um, and things that we can obviously, like, reel off and be be excited about, which I feel like is a good way of starting things off. Yes. So, I think with that, uh, we're both going to bid you guys farewell, if you've stuck it out this long, because we're at the around the 90 minute mark now so i think that's probably feature length baby feature length so you know if you've stuck with us this long thank you so much and we'll be back next time check the show notes for social media shit Um, and all the all the generic plug plug shit you know uh, obviously um when we sort of know what we're doing a bit more i'll have some i'll have a pre-prepared spiel to read about the social media links but for now check the show notes search kino inferno you'll find it i'll set it up it's cool. We'll get it all sorted. We'll get it all sorted. This is this is the first of many, and it's gonna mm. it's only gonna get better from here. Uh, so when we'll see you guys Pro- next time. Promises, it's... promises, promises. I know. I feel like I said that and immediately regretted it. Yeah. Now, now I've set the I've set the bar quite high now. I just want to point um, out that is not legally binding. We may <laughs> we may get worse over time. So yeah, next time uh, we're gonna have something a bit different. We're not gonna be talking about uh, you know man babies and their artistic careers. We're gonna be talking about something a little bit a little bit darker. Uh, but we're not going to tell you because you're going to have to tune in next time to find out what that is. I'm excited to find out what it is. I can't re- <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> we'll see you next time, guys. Peace out. That's it. Show's over. Good night, Springton. There will be no encores.